and welcome to another HYS Now virtual coffee hour. We're so delighted to have you join us today in our discussion of water insecurity and child health. The HYS Now series was created in late 2020 and launched in early 2021 after it was clear that we would have to convene virtually for a while during the pandemic. So I thank our audience for not just dropping in today, but for continuing to be an active audience month after month. HY's Now series has extended our professional networks and even spawned a few research collaborations. So we really appreciate your energy. After taking the summer off in, in 2022, we have some more engaging conversations booked throughout the fall with two November episodes coming soon. The first in two weeks, we'll discuss multiple use water systems for water and food security. And the second is about convergence science and water security, another two weeks after that. Please check our website or just watch our listserv for details. And remember that we openly welcome suggestions for future HYS Now episodes and topics from our audience. For those new to the HYS community, I'm Justin Stoller, an associate professor at the University of Miami in Florida, where I generally study global environmental health disparities. I'm also an executive committee member of the Household Water and Security Experiences Research Coordination Network, or HYS RCN, a collaboration that has been going on for many years. The financial support of the National Science Foundation since 2018, we've built a community of practice that fosters theoretical and methodological advances for the study of water insecurity at the household scale. For members of the audience who would like to learn more, please visit our website and do join our community. As a reminder, we are recording this event and we'll host it on the YouTube channel. I just pasted into the chat there after the talk. Our, our format is designed as an informal discussion and we really encourage your questions and comments in the chat box. Um, so please paste them in there as, as ideas come up. I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, our goal is to keep this uh, informal and conversational. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's introduce our four panelists, actually three panelists today, each of whom are mid-career, but with significant experience um, working with pediatric issues and, and child health. Panelists, after I introduce each of you, can you please tell us anything else that you want us to know and particularly what drew you to the water sector and, and the study of children? So let's start with, with Joanne. Um, Joanne Gear is director of the Water Security Research Center, co-lead of the Tackling Poverty Through Action on Climate Change pillar of Climate UA, UEA, a member of the Building Up Resilience Tyndall Research Theme Group, and a lecturer in the School of Health Sciences at the University of East Anglia in Norfolk, U uh, United Kingdom. Welcome, Joe. Tell us more. Thank you, and thanks for having me here today. Um, yeah, I guess the maybe the bit extra is that I'm a physiotherapist or physical therapist, as people would call them in the US, um, which sometimes seems an odd start point for people doing water research, but really that was my uh, link into global health and particularly the physical injury side of problems that people face or challenges for people with disabilities in accessing water. Um, so yeah, happy to be with you today and uh, look forward to chatting with everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, next, I wanna introduce Stephen. Stephen Rue is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at The Ohio State University and member of the Human Biological Anthropology Laboratory. He's a medical anthropologist with additional graduate training in Latin American studies and public health. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, yeah, so my research really looks at children's water insecurity. In particular, I work in the Brazilian Amazon and my dissertation research is currently looking at how children experience and perceive household water insecurity. And I was really drawn to this because I do a lot of work in policy and global consulting. And when I began looking into water insecurity, there was a clear void where children were just not being, they were being acknowledged but not being addressed. So it became the very focal point of my research to capture children's experiences. All right, thanks. We're delighted to have you here, Stephen. And, and last but certainly not least, Shaleen Collins is a doctoral candidate at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She's a public health nutrition professional with experience living and working throughout Latin America, Northern Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to going back to school at Tulane, she was one of our research coordinators in our original HYS project at Northwestern University. Welcome back, Shaleen. 
Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, so some additional information about me. I'm a registered dietitian as well. And so I really got into um, the field of water insecurity via food insecurity. Um, I was working managing a longitudinal cohort study in Kenya on HIV and food insecurity and doing some pilot research. Um, and women, you know, kept reminding us in this pilot research about infant feeding and food insecurity that um, water played a huge role in, in how they um, how they fed their infants when they started complementary feeding, um, exclusive breastfeeding, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, we sort of pivoted a little bit and started um, thinking about measuring water in uh, the maternal infant diet. Um, and so my research for my dissertation is really kind of looking at water insecurity in the first 1,000 days and building out the consequences of water insecurity beyond you know, diarrheal disease, um, which is traditionally what's in the public health literature and other literature as well. So I'm excited to be here and, and discuss this. Well, again, thank you all for, for giving your time across time zones and, and so forth. Um, it's going to be a fun discussion. And so I, I want to start and open our discussion by acknowledging that there is an enormous scientific literature that goes back, I mean, over 100 years about WASH and child health. But that literature really is overwhelmingly focused on diarrheal diseases, which, of course, is because these mostly waterborne infections have been a significant driver of, of infant and child mortality for most of human history. Right. But water insecurity, as we know, affects child health and wellness in many, many more ways. What do you think are the most neglected issues that come to mind with respect to how water insecurity is related to the health of health and wellness of, of infants, children, youth, or teenagers? Stephen, could we start with you? Absolutely. Um, oh gosh, you know, to be honest, I think there are a lot of issues that have yet to be covered extensively. Um, one of the issues I see most prevalently is how water insecurity affects children more than just within the physical, physical, physiological aspects of it. We really ha don't have much information on how children experience and perceive water insecurity, both, both physically or both emotionally and both how it impacts their daily routines, how it impacts their livelihood. We understand that it does, and we often understand that from a very adult-centered perspective, but for children, we're really missing that element of, well, what is their opinion on this? What is their, what are they exactly experiencing? And I think a lot of that has to do with lost opportunity to engage in um, elements like attending school, um, other social sort of opportunities to further skills or to play and interact with other children. So I think that's one of the most glaring issues that comes to mind is those, are those other elements of water insecurity. How does it disrupt a child's everyday life, really? Very, very interesting. Um, Joe, did you want to build on that for us? Yeah, um, I'd agree. And certainly that's um, the sort of issues that I've heard children raise in my own small bit of research around that when we spoke to kids. Um, but I think also for children, it's important looking at the um, effect on their carer. If you're thinking of infants, so from the very um, beginning, opportunities for um, infants carers to access healthcare in the perinatal health period, um, for example, in a recent project for water aid, we had qualitative data suggesting that some mothers were instructed to physically carry their own hot water to hospital to give birth, um, which we found <laughs> astounding, um, but also leading to inadequate supervision of small children. So creating things like a risk of accidental injury or death because they're insufficiently supervised while older children or carers are collecting water, um, for example, risk of drowning um, or, or risk of simply of physical injury because there isn't a responsible or able-bodied adult um, nearby to look after them. Um, a few other things, but I'll, I'll let Shalene chip in perhaps. Sure, so um, some of the things that have come up in my own work are, um, Violence, so exposure to violence, um, both for women um, who are collecting water while pregnant, postpartum. Um, sometimes women are collecting water, you know, immediately postpartum, like within days of delivery, which um, carries tons of inherent risks to health and well-being. Um, and then, you know, set, sending children to collect water also carries risks of violence. Um, and recently, a co-author and I um, published a, a scoping review of um, impacts of violence, and certainly. Um, 
of water and security impacts on violence or, or violence impacts on water and security. And, um, and it seems like, you know, those relationships are, are pretty well established in the literature, no less so among children and sort of there is intergenerational patterns of violence where um, there's the expectation that children will collect water and then violence is enacted against them by caregivers for not collecting water on time or not collecting enough. Um, and that can sometimes be kind of couched or nested within this um, intra-household violence that's occurring and then kind of trickling down to the child. Um, in some of my own work, I've also um, looked at high income contexts and how um, exposure to uh, chemicals or um, heavy metals and water supply can lead to um, congenital defects, preterm delivery, um, how exposure to salinity and water can lead to preeclampsia. Um, so they're really, you know, in thinking about child health, you can really take it all the way back to thinking about um, pregnancy and the impacts that water, um, water access, water quality have on pregnancy and how those um, impacts kind of go along to or are passed along to the child and then impact the lifespan um, in the ways that we see with food insecurity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd agree. Can I chip in with an additional comment there? Um, yeah, yeah, just um, in terms of the violence, I've been working um, or helping a little bit with a, a woman in DRC Congo who's looking into violence against girls during their um, water fetching. So in addition to what Shalene has explained, also violence en route um, perpetrated by um, unknown adults towards the girls, but also between the girls themselves as they queue um, and arguments or conflicts can break out within the queues as well. Um, so really sort of, yeah, a lot, a lot of that interpersonal violence associated with the process of accessing water, but then also highlighted in some other countries where water community water points tend to be located along either very busy roads or roads that might have infrequent but high speed traffic. Um, I've worked with people in hospitals in Uganda who um, sort of somewhat anecdotally at this point claim that the children's wards are full of, full of children from road accidents that have occurred um, as they've been attempting to collect water near very busy roads. It's interesting to, to hear about these projects and, and experiences, um, what, what you've seen abroad. It, it sounds like violence against children or violence and injuries that involve children really is happening at multiple scales. It's happening within the household from, from who, who are supposed to be caregivers, right? Not abusers um, who are dealing with all kinds of other stressors, of course, that, that prompt that kind of behavior. Um, all kinds of, of injuries and, and violent encounters within the community, so forth. You know, Stephen, has, has this touched your research as well, violence and injuries? Absolutely. I mean, and it's different because in oftentimes when we think about these violence and injuries, they, they come out of context where children or adults have to travel long distances to acquire water, and that requires them leaving the home. In some of the contexts I work in, in the Brazilian Amazon, well, there's water everywhere. Um, so it's not, and sometimes the water is actually accessible in the home. But the environmental aspect of the water also causes this new issue where, uh, you know, children just can't walk outside without being exposed to all the waste and chemicals or the pathogens that may be in just water that's laying on the ground or children are playing outside and it kind of goes with the supervision, but it's an issue where children can get in trouble for playing because, and they'll get scolded or abused because of their play because they want to go play in the water. It's inherently a very attractive element and kind of very important to children's development to explore their environment, but then they'll get in trouble because they're going to play in the water and they could risk injury, they could risk exposure, or they could be seen as risking uh, contaminating the water source that people use sometimes as well. Uh, so it kind of varies from these contexts of water scarcity to water abundance, what sort of injury and violence, although very similar often, you can come in contact with. I know another issue is just not only the toxic waste, but the physical waste that gets left in water sources sometimes. So children will wander with a wade into water sources and then there's all kinds of just refuge that can vary from you know glass, metal, everyday trash that children are just then wading in and exposed to. So it can be very complicated and it's very hard um, to keep a child from doing that because you can't always watch a child and Children don't always listen to what parents tell them or they're curious and they explore. So it's a very 
delicate situation when you look at those opportunities for injury and violence. So given all these neglected issues and they span the, the environmental, the social, the behavioral, what do you see as some of the research frontiers that seem especially fruitful for insights from children and youth that might help us accelerate safe water efforts around the world? And I know people don't typically think of those as going hand in hand. We think of accessible safe water. We think about you know clean water sources and new wells and pipe systems, things like that. But But we all know that when we implement those around the world that just the mere existence of them doesn't mean that people have access to them for, for you know, all the reasons that we've been starting to discuss. Where, where are the research frontiers for, for children and youth? Shaleen, can we bounce back to you? Sure. So um, I see that um, Mitu Chowdhury is on the line and I um, want to kind of bring, um, bring her work to the forefront. So um, Household water insecurity, as we've seen, is associated with child nutrition. And I think this um, you know, kind of pivoting from thinking about just water being associated with diarrheal disease um, or child health through sort of like physical health pathways. Um, there's really not a lot of literature on um, how water insecurity impacts child nutrition beyond, you know, stunting, wasting, underweight. And so really digging into thinking about, you know, dietary diversity um, and, and other alternative pathways within nutrition, like complementary feeding, breastfeeding. I know um, Rosie and Schuster and colleagues did, had a great paper about the ways in which um, water insecurity impacts infant feeding. And so I think this is really um, a good um, area of expansion that that is really important. We know that nutrition in early life has um, physical, psychological, economic impacts across the lifespan. So um, I think expanse into this, this area is really important. And as a dietitian, I'm biased, so. <laughs> Building off of that, I think it's also really important that we look at how these change across, um, across the entire spectrum of child development, because we have a lot of data on children under five typically, which is where a lot of research gets centered on. And then we have a little bit more data as children get older into the 15, 16 year old range where they start being either seen as adults or heads of home, depending on the situation. Um, but we are really missing this gap, this in-between and how, how water insecurity changes with a child's lifetime because ultimately the water and nutritional needs of the child are very different when they're very young to when they get to five, six, seven, and then they get into middle childhood a little bit more, eight, nine, 10. And this is very particular with gender and you know, particularly with young women and girls who have their reproductive health needs, different water and you know, water resources. And they, be, they often begin to be more responsible for younger children as well. So there's really this spectrum of how water insecurity changes through a child's life that I think we're really missing. And it's really that in between the very young and then the closer to what we assume is an adult that we're them 16, 17 and 18. Yeah, I like both of those points. And I, I just think um, from what I've seen, this tends to be a lot more cross-sectional um, or snapshot survey studies on water insecurity, which I think are great at demonstrating associations between problems, but what, I think would be really beneficial. And I think Shalene mentioned a longitudinal study, but to have more longitudinal studies or before and after studies, because I think what we need to look toward achieving as researchers, if we can, is to get government and stakeholder buy-in to invest in um, improving water access and making it safer and improving water security. And so demonstrating over time, um, outcomes and evaluating benefits more accurately and clearly, I think, is really key. And so that taking that lifespan approach, I think, would really benefit that. Um, so following children over time to see, you know, how increased water security actually does lead to better um, dietary and growth outcomes, but also engagement and attendance at school to family incomes. Um, and I think also, I always bring child issues back to the family and carers. And so monitoring things like carers' levels of stress due to water insecurity and problems with family dynamics and relationships due to water insecurity. And perhaps studies that um, even if they can't be before and after that they're perhaps qualitative studies looking at 
changes in people's family life before and after improved water access um, so that you can capture that um, the quality of relationships in a family that enable children to flourish or create additional challenges for them and there have been some lovely studies um, showing that and that that you know improved dynamic and reducing the stress of parents because they have a more secure reliable water supply can really then have a big knock-on effect on the quality of relationships parents ability to spend time with their kids supporting them with education or even sometimes just playing um, you know when children are younger so that they they do actually they're in a position to to, to provide good quality parenting I think is really key um, so yeah they're things that I would add to that point I think also, also adding oh sorry no go ahead <laughs> I was going to say also adding to that um, this relationship between caregivers and children um, is is this idea of buffering I think Barbara Pipperata has a great paper on um, nutrition buffering and um, and food insecurity buffering, but really nothing like that exists for water yet. Um, though I, I did find some um, some sort of references to buffering in, in Kenya in a qualitative study, but I think also looking at these relationships a little bit more um, critically and thinking about intra-household um, water allocation, water distribution, who's collecting the water, what are the impacts that it has on them, and, and how does it influence these, these care um, relationships between um, children and parents. I think it's really important. What, what do you mean by buffering, Shaleen? I haven't heard that word used in this context before. Sure. Sure. So um, it, essentially buffering behavior is when um, one person will sort of shield others in the household from experiences of resource insecurity. So, um, you know, moms generally or, or women generally in, um, in some contexts will sent sort of you know drink less water or um, use dirty water to drink or dirty water to bathe with prioritize clean water safe water for other household members or just forego water entirely in Kenya women often said that they just would skip drinking water skip bathing so that their partner their male partners could have water for bathing water for drinking their children could have water for complimentary food that sort of thing great thanks for that there's another sure. point I'd like to add I think that could be um really beneficial is if I, I think there are a lot of um, sort of projects that occur where charitable organizations, for example, um, implement things that are intended to improve water access or water security. And often they have their project outcomes. But on reviewing some of these for a UK charity, um, often they're not collecting um, a wide range of data that could show the potential benefits. They're often collecting indicators that are much more focused on what's implemented in the project, but not capturing these broader beneficial effects. And I think that perhaps researchers could work more closely with implementing organizations if, if they have good relationships to try and assist them with the quality of research data that's collected as projects are rolled out um, over time. And I think that could be a, you know, a really beneficial way of hooking in some research where you're not having to secure large amounts of research funding to deliver the projects, but you have an active role in evaluating their outcomes. I think adding to that also examining water insecurity in humanitarian settings. I mean, water for humanitarian use is largely couched within WASH or just meeting the steer standards of the amount of water that people need per day, the minimum amount. And so I think, you know, kind of thinking about how do children experience water insecurity? How do, um, you know, pregnant pregnant individuals, so part of individuals, um, how, what are those consequences in humanitarian settings when water resources are severely stressed or there are difficulties with transboundary water ownership? Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest issues we often see is that so many interventions are designed just on simple provision of water that they don't consider, I mean, not only for children, but for any other needs across the household, because we know very well, particularly with adults, they don't experience water insecurity the same way. And certainly, if anything, the food insecurity literature shows us that children and adults have very different perceptions of household water insecurity or household food insecurity. And it's just, and that's one of the big things in my research I'm looking at is, okay, well, how do child and adult perceptions of household water security really differ? Because if it's anything like what we see in food insecurity, then there's this whole experiences that are often ignored. 
And interventions often fail because they're not designed for children, whether that's providing some sort of wash service like a latrine or a toilet, whether that's providing a pipe stand. Oftentimes they are unsuited for children. They're suited for what they assume to be a normal adult. And that's when you have some of these instances where violence occurs or children are afraid to use these services because they are not designed for them. They're unfamiliar. And in some cases, a, a service is provided where water is maybe not piped directly into the home, but it is close enough. And an actual what happens is that the uh, that actually creates more stress on the child because they're expected to go get water more frequently. So I think one of the big challenges and one of the big areas for research to engage in is not only is not only the, is the evaluation of interventions afterwards, but also the ahead of time with policymakers and engineers who often design these things. How do we incorporate our research into assuring that things are actually designed for children in the context they're existing, rather than just the provision aspect and that's but that's a very hard thing to break it's we're very focused on the provision of water yeah i, I couldn't agree more with that joe that point that you brought up that the, the program evaluation you know focuses on you know sometimes counting the number of wells but not really the human-centered impacts i i just finished writing um a project deliberately about uh, explicitly about this and, and maybe this is something we can you know, spin off into into a future age wise now episode. Um, I think it's it's something that people are really thinking about. Um, you know, counting the wrong things and, and maybe even underselling um, the the impact that that wash programs, water interventions, and so forth have on communities. Uh, that we, we don't do a good job of of selling how transformative they are for communities. So, so thank you. That so many research frontiers um, involving children. Really interesting stuff. And and we've started to get some comments from the audience. I want to dial back to a, a great question from Sally Weston. I'm um, going back to our, our discussion about violence and, and its effects on children. Um, she asks, as you can see in the chat here, um, if, if violence, child, child related violence is related to drinking water collection outside the household, which um, I assume that means fetching activities and so forth, or can violence be driven by water insecurities, driven by pipe supplies? And I have some ideas about that, but I'm, I'm wondering what, what each of you think. Shaleen? So I think it really depends on, you know, the reliability of the pipe supplies, right? Just because you have piped water doesn't mean you are water secure. And so I think, you know, kind of thinking back to um, interventions where um, the amount of wells are measured or the number of people who are connected to municipal water supply, for example, are, are kind of our indicator of water security. It's, it's, it's clear from the research that um, you can't really gauge water insecurity based on water access alone. I mean, there are other domains of water insecurity, certainly, um, such as quality, reliability, sufficiency, um, that even if you have access to a tap, if it doesn't turn on, then you're not really water, water secure. So um, I think it, ideally, you know, if, um, if piped water were clean and, and could be provided in the household, then perhaps um, it could bring down, um, bring down violence. But um, in our study of, of water insecurity and violence, we found that water, that violence really occurred within the household between partners generally, um, sort of IPV mostly, um, while going to water collection points um, due to like, you know, brushy um, foliage or, or things walking, you know, people being, you know, kind of hiding or understanding of water collection schedules, and then at water points themselves, either between people um, collecting water or between um, water vendors and individuals getting water. Um, so I, I think my answer is, is maybe, but, but maybe not, <laughs> that's, that's sort of a non-answer. Um, I, I love others to chime in. No, I think you've hit on a really good point, which is the reliability of water supply, because if the water is not reliable, then it's still a stressor. And one of the avenues that for this opportunity for both emotional and physical violence against children because of water is it's just the stress that it generates, whether, and that could be between two heads of household partners, and then children just become an outlet for that? Or should a child um, be wasteful with water for any reason? Should they use too much? Should they knock it over? Those are all points of anger or potential points of anger. And we certainly know that in some cases, adults will then lash out against children or they will express their anger against children. Um, it's also depending on how many other stresses you've got going on in the household. If the water supply is there, but you're still not able to meet all the needs and demands for water every day, that's an additional stressor. And 
that often builds up and you can have those instances where children are just, they become outlets. Um, and we even know that children between each other can get angry. Um, when I'm not as familiar with it in the home because that is still this sort of void element of well, how are these inner household dynamics in the home, but particularly between children, but Children can get mad at each other for wasting water in some cases, or they'll get mad at each other when they're trying to collect water. So there's a number of opportunities for violence, whether there is water or whether you have to go get water. And the additional stress of paying for piped water, if that's Absolutely. something that has to be done. And affordability is, is a good point. It's the reliability that both of you touched upon that is what I was originally thinking about, um, not just availability, reliability, but intermittency and predictability of, of that water supply, right? So as you both mentioned, just because you've got connection to a pipe water source doesn't mean the water's always flowing, it's always the same quality. And actually in, in several of our HY studies, sometimes the data hasn't always been published. Um, there's, there's something I'm working on with Amber Pearson that we hope to get out by the end of the year. I'm focusing on this predictability issue. Um, in, in some of our analyses, the whether or not the, the water service was predictable is like by far the, the, the most strong association with people's psychosocial um, feelings about water and the stress and the anxiety that they're dealing about. Like when, when the water is occurring on a predictable basis, even if it's intermittent, you can adapt and adjust and figure things out, right? But when it's unpredictable and you just don't know, it just drives people nuts. It, it, it like um, is really, really disruptive in the household. And so, yeah, I'm glad we we talked about that again something that that uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk about in another hy's now episode in, in a few months so um wonderful wanted to also go back to the chat Nitu had, had chimed in and, and mentioned that an important pathway linking female adolescent children's health to water insecurity is menstrual hygiene management this is also important from the perspective of intra-household water sharing how, how water is allocated within the household um, where women are in the hierarchy of, of who gets how much water after who's used it and so forth. Um, Shalene, I think you maybe know a bit more about this. And, and could you also comment on uh, menstrual hygiene management? I feel like often is, is lumped in with sanitation and hygiene products and not always talked about um, relative to water interventions, but obviously water is such, a, such an integral part of that. Um, could, you, could you kick that off and, and comment on that? Sure, yeah, of course. Um, so absolutely, this is um, a huge issue and is typically couched within um, sanitation. So I think maybe not appropriately, right? Um, we know that um, in many places, um, individuals who menstruate use um, reusable products. And so it does require water to clean them, sometimes requires quite a bit of water. And um, I think among adolescents, especially there, there can be elements of shame um, associated with, um, with cleaning menstrual products or even menstrual ma management in general. And um, there are many studies that discuss um, you know, how menstruation leads to truancy and, and you know, um, if, if um, girls don't have access to latrines um, or, you know, sort of um, safely managed water sources where they can, can, can manage um, menstrual hygiene products and, and just kind of, um, you know, engage with like the hygiene that they prefer and, um, and households certainly um, negotiating um, scarce resources, I think can contribute to a lot of that sort of like stress and, and shame that, that come along with, um, with menstruation in many, many places. Um, I would love for others to also chime in on this. Well, you know, I think another place this becomes important is also when children are attending school, I think schools are often seen as like, uh, and water insecurity in school is still, I think, an under uh, understudied issue. Um, but this ought that there have been several studies that look at this where schools do not have running water, their toilets are in disarray. So all the basic infrastructure people need to maintain basic hygiene isn't there. And when you have to be changing menstrual products in, during the middle of the day and you can't attend school, you're often, you, a, a young girl may be unable to because they don't feel that it is safe because they may fear a risk of infection or there just may be no privacy because the infrastructure isn't maintained and there's so little provision of water and sanitation that, you know, it's not only going to be in the home, it's going to be, it's going to be at school and perhaps at other institutions as well. So I think the level of infrastructure that is provided is also another really critical issue, both inside and outside the home. I would agree with all those points. I'm not sure I have anything in addition really to add. Just reaching for my mute button there, fell out of my hand. Okay, 
Um, well, let's, there was one more thing I was hoping we could talk about, um, pending any questions that, that pop up in the chat. And, and this is that one of the reasons that adult perspectives tend to dominate the water security literature, as, as Stephen noted in the beginning, is that working with children presents additional logistical challenges in terms of participant recruiting, consent, ethical oversight, and so on and so forth. Can some of you describe the, the important trade-offs in working with children in terms of the, the extra work you have to do developing your research design versus you know, all the, the new rich things that we can learn from child or youth-focused studies? And maybe Stephen, can you start us off because you've, you've already written- I one can, one. yes. You've written one of those oddities. Tell us about um, it. I did. So, I mean, it is so clear. The problem is when you, when you go to advocate for children's needs, or any population's need where there isn't this data, they'll go, okay, well, that's great. But then, so what? Where is the information on that, right? And yes, maybe there are, there is extra, there are so many extra things you need to consider when you're working with children because they are seen as a vulnerable population and that changes from country to country. But the value of having their input is incredible because we know it's missing. We know things are not working because there's a lack of child-centered research in water insecurity. And if we see these same mismatches in other insecurities like food insecurity with adults, then we're also very aware that an adult perspective isn't enough because that means we're masking what children are experiencing. And you can't address the issues if you can't say, okay, well, this is what a child is actually experiencing in these contexts. And that goes across the ages, right? So it takes a little bit more inventive method design and it takes a little bit of thought because you know, it'll depend on the age of child you're working with, um, but it's all, and it'll depend on where you're working with as to what exactly assent and consent look like. But it becomes pretty invaluable when you actually go to address these issues because you need to be able to point out, okay, well, this is what a child's experiencing and this is what they are missing because of the way things are designed. So I think the trade off is kind of like working with any vulnerable population, it's a little bit extra work. But it's incredibly necessary if we're going to actually move from conducting research on these issues of human suffering to actually then addressing them both in policy and further research. Joe, did you want to add to that? Yeah, um, yeah, I can chip in and it's um, issues, I guess, that were raised in, in studies I was involved with where we did interview children and particularly included them in, in the studies. So there are those ethical issues around appropriately seeking assent and consent um, and involving the caregivers. And um, I guess my, my, my point would be to often um, see what resources are available within the context you're working in. So in South Africa in particular, um, where we did a project, they have probably some of the best um, processes for supporting child protection in any place I've worked in, in terms of um, involvement in research. So I, I think when I started, I, I didn't realize quite how skilled some of the local academics were in terms of um, understanding issues around child involvement in research and how to do that safely and issues around safeguarding. So we, we had sort of built into our projects um, periods of time to work through and have workshops on um, safeguarding and consent issues for children, which were beneficial for everyone involved, I think, um, in the long run. But I guess the extra points I wanted to add were that I think working with children gives these lovely opportunities, I think, as Stephen was saying, of working in a variety of settings so and taking um, different approaches. So having a real family centered approach, as I've mentioned, because of the importance of relationships within the family unit um, or having an education centered approach where you can, you know, work in the setting of education provision and that then opens up the education sector as being a very important um, setting and mechanism through which information about water security issues can be developed and shared um, with other children and the broader community as well. Um, so I think, and it also then opens up those opportunities for really enjoyable and fun ways of doing research that are just much less boring than working with adults. <laughs> so. I feel like you need to tell us more. Any any examples? 
Oh, just some of my favourite um, experiences were doing little focus group with kids in, in villages, you know, where they'd all be sitting around under a tree and you'd have, you know, things going on in the background, but just sort of like the cheekiness and the fun that they sort of um, exude when when they're in a group, uh, I think is, is really great. But also mixed in with that is sometimes some really quite profound insights that you get, as Stephen was saying. So, you know, I, I still remember some of the quotes from very little children explaining their perspective about, well, it's just not fair when I have to go and get water and the adults are all sitting around under the shade of a tree not doing anything but I have to go out in the hot sun and get water and, and a very and you know and also stating things like it's not fair when kids are not given um, you know enough clothes and food so sort of things coming out of those interactions that just about break your heart but also then raise those safeguarding issues that you have to have maybe planned for and have mechanisms in place um, so that you understand what the appropriate next steps are should concerns be sort of flagged or raised. Um, yeah. Absolutely. The honesty of children. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem that keeps it fun. <laughs> Stephen and then well, Julian. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's one of those things, uh, children are so often because of the household approach or because the adult centered approach, children are just kind of assumed to just be a part of things, but children are so hyper aware of their situation. They're, they very much understand what's going on. And so the insights that they give to you, are, I, I mean, they just, they can be so unique because also as an adult, sometimes you sort of forget that what it was like to be a child in different situations, depending on the context you've grown up in they see things that you're not necessarily paying attention to. And it, it also uh, it brings up this really great point of like really working with children and testing methods, seeing what really works with children to make them comfortable with you as a researcher, but also how do they like to express themselves? Uh, for many qualitative researchers, we still have this mind of like the straightforward interview, but I, one of the most, I have had so much fun testing visual methods with children and drawings when I was in the Amazon this past spring worked extremely well to kind of break the mold and children could express themselves in different ways. And, you know, sometimes at first you, it seems like you have a, you're working with a very shy child and maybe they don't have a lot to say, but then they start drawing and they start thinking and they start drawing more. And then I've gone, I've had conversations that last 30 minutes because they just started getting excited and they want to express what they're thinking about and going through. And so they'll just keep taking out pieces of paper and they'll keep drawing things. And it's these really wonderful ways that, you know, you can engage with children and really make sure they feel comfortable with expressing themselves, but also not relying on the traditional methods we normally think about when conducting research. I second that. I think um, the visual sort of emerging um, research using, you know, drawing and that sort of thing with children is just so amazing. Um, we know that photo voice with adults has the potential to yield very powerful results and um, an insight. And so I think, you know, kind of um, framing that for children, framing a similar methodological approach for children, I think is just really spectacular. Um, I also want to add that. Um, Kind of thinking about early life, um, early life development, and then moving into child development, um, recruiting from antenatal care units, so recruiting women during pregnancy, and kind of thinking about water insecurity um, from the perspective of pregnancy and then postpartum and in in early life um, is really important. And so that that can be a way to um, really capture some of these um, consequences that that water insecurity does have. Um, within very vulnerable windows um, and often amongst um, vulnerable individuals. Um, I think I think it has also has the potential for um, for a lot of interesting um, learning and um, and is really important and, and needs to be expanded upon. I think too if I could share um, perhaps this is an indirect um, not an experience I've had, but colleagues of mine who've used music and dance a lot with adults and particularly in talking about um, risk and traumatic events, use that as a really effective way of um, building rapport and trust 
um, and just talking about, you know, what's your favourite song or your favourite music or dance. And I haven't done that with kids myself, but I think that would be an amazing um, way to engage um, through music and play um, that could get that interaction that starts to reveal really different things around water insecurity and purposes of water, um, which links me back to another point that I did want to make um, just around we've we talk a lot about water insecurity and I think I'd really love to see um, built into studies or as we've mentioned and alluded to the positive effects of water security um, and so how that can really enable people to flourish because in health literature that's you know the focus is always on <clears throat> poor health and problems um, because they're quite rightly prioritized I think when we're arguing the case for improving water security, we need to shine a light on the really positive beneficial impacts um, for quality of life, particularly creating those opportunities for kids to, you know, to, to flourish and develop and grow through play and um, education and, and also, you know, sometimes having those chores, family chores and roles that are about learning reciprocity and being part of a, um, a family unit that works together is good, but having that nice balance in a, a family that's not overly stressed through insecurity and supported through actual water security, I think. Absolutely. And I just want to add on to that because I think there's a there's on the other side of that, there are some there's an important point to recognize that children don't always see the the, the, when we talk about water insecurity, it's often, it, and it's not to undermine it because it is an issue and it does cause many you know, health consequences, both physical and emotional. But sometimes children find enjoyment or find some um, benefit out of doing these, the, the chores and tasks that they're assigned. So they don't always see, and I think this is more, most important for us as researchers, not to cast just people's situation into a negative light that sometimes collecting water gives them a sense of purpose or strength or taking care of somebody by engaging in a coping strategy or sometimes they find ways to enjoy themselves when doing these activities like um, just it, whether it's opportunities for play or for getting out. So it's this, I do, I really agree. I think there's this balance between recognizing the issues of insecurity but also not completely in both the population level and, and when they were working with people uh, not stigmatizing everything as a consequence of water insecurity. That's just so detrimental. Uh, and with children, I think that's incredibly important because children are very, they're, they, they like to find ways to engage in things and kind of make it enjoyable or find some enjoyment in them. So I think that's such an incredibly valuable point. And it's just, it just reminds me too of some of the, when we did work with little kids and ask them, you know, what, what did, being healthy mean to them what was their perspective of health and actually being able to carry water was a definition for them for some of them was the example when you're you know carrying water that's being healthy being able to go and get it and you know fulfill your role in the family sort of thing um so yeah i agree with that really good points and uh also want to just throw out there, you know, we have to keep in mind, you know, water insecurity is just one form of resource insecurity that, that often households are facing, facing multiple problems at one time. You have to be careful if we, if we solve the problem of children water fetching, for example, that that time savings isn't just, you know, stolen by some other set of chores that, that are causing the same problems with them being able to attend school and interact with their friends and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, and, and, and Sally notes in the chat, I remember reading somewhere that water collection queues are where the community thrives. It's where mostly women talk to each other and share friendships. I would imagine this is the, is the same for children. Yes, fetching sometimes is, um, is you know, brutal physiologically, but, but sometimes quite a, a nice social outlet, a way for, for women and children to get out of the home and, and, and be able to interact with each other. And yeah. And that's why community input in, in these interventions and the way they're designed is, is just so important, right? That you're not robbing households, you know, women, children, whoever your target audience is, robbing them of, of something that, that helps them build social capital, that's a, a source of enjoyment, while, you know, ostensibly trying to fix some other problem that, that we see from the outside, right? That's, that's not the right way to do things. So. There is any, another any last, point here, Justin. Yeah. yeah, can I sneak in the last comment? I mean, that, that last point is so true. And um, I know my thinking has shifted a bit on this over the years, but in terms of 
I think we have to be particularly careful around, you know, a lot of our, um, a lot of populations are too sedentary and not active enough and, and suffer from a lack of physical activity. So, you know, if um, engaging in collecting water is safe and builds community and friendships, it can be one way that people meet the levels of physical activity that are important for health as well. So, um, you know, as always, it's around what's the experience of those people in that community and, and how does it play out? But the other thing also is around then that role of um, stewardship of local water sources and sites linking in um, with regular access from communities to water points um, and perhaps even spiritual significance of various places to the community and, and how they engage with their environment. Thanks, Joe. F final comments from Jolene or Stephen? I agree. I think um, you really you really nailed it when you said it depends on the community. This is why qualitative work in any field is so important. Just understanding what it, how the community experiences resource insecurity, if you even perceive it as resource insecurity, and really developing our uh, research and our interventions around um, community perceptions, household perceptions, individual perceptions, instead of imposing um, you know interventions based on you know. Of regression. <laughs> we really need to think critically and work with communities to understand means versus, you know, imposing. Absolutely. I mean, it's only just to highlight the importance of how everything intersects. And even when we speak about water insecurity, it's, it's very much intersecting with food insecurity, energy insecurity, and really just any other insecurities a community or area might be facing. It's, they're so intertwined. And so, whenever you're doing research on, on something like water insecurity, it's never just the water. And it's so many other things. Um, and the context and the history of the context matters because sometimes you're looking at an area that's, it's like we've just talked, discussed, there's no expectation of water provision. So perhaps they don't perceive themselves to be water insecure versus a context where there is perception of, or the expectation of water provision by the state. Uh, in other cases, it could be, you know, very different with how many, where, how new the community is, and particularly the history and legacy of neglect. And you're looking at situations that are the result of years of, of political and social neglect, hundreds of thousands of dollars of infrastructure. So it's that context and the intersectionality that is just so, and like we've talked about, it's just so important to keep in mind. You're on mute, Justin. Of course, I would mess that, up, mess that up right at the end of the session. I, I want to wind things down, keep things within the hour as promised, but, and I want to close things down by thanking again our, our panelists for their time and the amazing insights we've had to our audience, both the live audience that was here engaging through their questions and our YouTube audience who will be watching this later on. I certainly hope you learned something new about opportunities working with children and youth in the WASH sector. And please feel free to follow up with us at hwise.rcn at gmail.com if you have questions, suggestions, or any collaboration ideas. I'll, I'll close with another reminder about two upcoming HWISE Now episodes about multiple use water systems for water and food security and convergence science and water security, both coming up later in November with additional episodes to be announced soon. Please watch the HWISE listserv or our events page on the HWISE RCN website for more details. And I certainly look forward to seeing you all again. To our friends around the world, take care and stay safe.